Hello everybody, welcome to another Valheim video. Today I have an interview for you with Bjorno. Planeswalkers is a Valheim community. You can find out more about them by looking on YouTube for the More Gaming channel, and if you want, you can look in the description of this video for a link to join their Discord server. They've been around for a long time, and I really enjoyed talking with Bjorn. It was very obvious that he has a passion for this game, and if you check out their channel, or you join the Discord, you'll see that they actually have a building competition going on. This will be mentioned in the interview, but the cool thing about it is it's actually an in-game competition, and there's time limits and restraints which really spice up the competition. But that's it for this introduction. For the rest of the video, you'll be hearing a conversation between myself and Bjorn. You can look in the timestamps to see the subjects that we cover. And if you want to be involved in any kind of Valheim interview just like this, then comment below and reach out to me. I'm happy to speak with anybody about Valheim, and I'll publish it on the channel. You could show your face, or we could meet in-game, or it can just be through audio in Discord, like the call you're about to listen to. Tell me a bit about what you were going through before you ever played Valheim. What was going on with you? What kind of games did you like? What was your life like? I was actually casting pro StarCraft II matches for a small esports team called Alpha X. Um, I created something called the Payback Series, which was essentially a revenge match. Like if you go to big to esports tournaments and you get beaten by this one guy, maybe he kicks your butt in the next few tournaments. I may take account of that and be like, hey, do you want to get revenge? And thus the Payback Series was born. Yeah, it's essentially a one versus one show match, a best of seven series. Uh, StarCraft II being an RTS for those that aren't aware. So usually uh, RTSs can get pretty, uh, if, you, if you don't want your opponent to win, you will do everything in your power to make it their life a living hell. And if, they, if you will do every rush under the sun and, and build in their base and just do the most obscure things. And that's kind of why the, the series took off, because of the nature of the show match. Let's say you take one of those show matches. Because of the rivalry or the, that aspect of it, they, they would unfold differently, is what you're saying? Oh, definitely, especially uh, with RTS games, there's something called meta, where it's essentially the, the, uh, the, the, brain, the mind games behind it all, the, the big brain plays, things you would do only because you know this opponent does this one thing every match because they're like robotic. So I did that for a while. I, w I was heavily into RTS games, uh, RPGs. I was a big uh, Japanese JRPG fan. Um, I was big into the Final Fantasies. Six and seven are the best, don't at me. I, I was just a normal kid who grew up in the 90s and uh, got a PlayStation and a Super Nintendo and a Nintendo 64, all the the big ones of that generation and it seemed like all the best games of that generation were heavily story based games back then didn't have as much leeway graphically as they do now in, in my head the best development has comes out of some constraints and constraints we, we think they're horrible but really constraints are actually a very useful creative tool that limit the infinity so that we can do something reasonable with it <laughs> I mean, isn't that not the biggest segue into why we love Valheim? It felt like the, the goal of the game wasn't to push out a game that's super shiny and, and has all these different elements to it. It was strictly a survival game. That, because it kind of brought you back to your childhood. When you'd play the game, it wouldn't exactly look the prettiest, but damn, did you not love it. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. So, so tell me more about that. When, when did you first pick up Valheim? When did you first play it? What was that like? Uh, I want to say it was in the first quarter of 2021. The game was st just coming out of Alpha, I believe. Yep. And we had, I decided, and then when I say we, like my group of people I was with at that time, decided that, you know, because of the pandemic and then the way things were going, that meeting up with people to play games sort of like how they do, for example, in South Korea, they have computer shops where pe everybody goes and just literally games there all day. We don't we don't have that option, but because of technology and the way it is, and you know, internet's available to almost everyone, meeting online doesn't seem all that too difficult. And it just kind of built from there. So so Valheim comes around, 
and you find that it's uh, it's feel feeling more of a chance to get some kind of community thing there, right? So so what happens next? I mean, it's it's a blur at this moment because it it feels like gaming years. In, in a weird way, they kind of speed by faster than normal years, but they also feel like they take forever. I got introduced to Valheim events, specifically the event side, through watching uh, Rich Campbell and Asmongold's first ever Valheim PvP tournament. It was some kind of last man standing event, right? Yeah, and it. The, I saw that and I was like, why can't we do more things like this? And for, I want to say, at least a good six months after that event happened, I didn't really see anything else. Like, no one else was doing Valheim tournaments. And me, I came from a scene that's super competitive and has tournaments on the reg. Like, if you go to any of the, the websites for RTS games and look at their calendar, there's show matches and tournaments and, you know, the, of course, bigger tournaments like Intel Extreme Masters, DreamHack, ML that did big, like, in-person esports events. And I was like, why? Valheim feels like in its nature of just being a, a big sandbox game and you could pretty much do anything from combat to building to taking a stroll you know the game feels like there's so many different ways that you can you could take that and and turn it into a team-based thing uh, have you ever seen the i think they're called arena heim but I, I only learned about them recently actually we actually did the the obstacle course like two years ago mm -hmm. that was very similar to the one that they did at arena heim and I mean, no one else was doing uh, an, a big stream obstacle course on YouTube and Twitch at that time. These ideas, even though they may not be original, like someone else definitely had the idea of an obstacle course, the idea of inviting multi-communities and, and doing giant multi-server events was something new. Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, ideas don't really matter. What matters is when they're actually put into reality and practice, because <laughs> having an idea is one thing. But actually manifesting it into this world is a—that's the real work right there. <laughs> so I, I'd say you've, you've done good by by showing people what's possible, um, especially with Valheim. It's it's almost shocking how much is actually possible with the game. Uh, we did a two v two two v two tournament with Jirox, uh, Jirox the Vikings tribe. Uh, we did something called Valheim Survivor, which was what we did two years ago. It was sort of like a Hunger Games type survival event, kind of like you're playing Valheim in Valheim. We did carve racing. Um, we did, we did, we, we are now doing something called vanilla only build competition, which is something that a lot of people tell me is something unique uh, for Valheim in terms of a build comp. Well, and yeah, because everyone easy. uses dev commands and all that sort of right. thing. You have a two hour timer to build your, your build. We have judges that come from multi-communities, like we have Dakar and Kongville coming in August to guest judge the next event, and they will be online in the world, choose a spot and build there, and still be connected through the way we designed the world to the, all the, all the, to the judges and all the other contestants. What are the rules exactly? Well, we have, we have Azu anti-cheat on the server, so people can't log in and do shenanigans with yeah. when it comes to the event. We also have a strict uh, nomenclature that we use for all new characters that come to the event. So we don't release the prefix of the character names until the date, literally like the event's about to start and people are about to log in. Yeah, nice, okay. nice, nice. We have to have VOBC 2024 dash before your character name to verify that you created a new character. And then of course they have the two hour time limit to build, they have uh, passive enemies, they have free builds so they can build whatever they want from the vanilla game. And in one hour they take a short break and then the next hour they build and finish up their the what's what's needed interior wise, etc. And then the judges go to town and we have a scoring system you know, 10 points for creativity 10 points for technique 10 points for functionality and then we do a community vote where we put a big poll in our discord and people literally even if you're just chilling in the voice chat, you get to make a make a vote. And the community vote definitely impacts it. It gives the, the winner of that 10 points. Yeah, and that, so, that's the, like an interaction too. I've More interactions is always good. That the timed aspect of building gives them like a rush they would almost get in a combat scenario. And I feel like that's what we were trying to go for because all the build contests are like, okay, just relax and build over a week and submit your build. And we're like, I mean, that is cool and everything. And it's not as exciting 
exciting community-wise to be a co-participant in. Uh, when you seeing that there's 15 minutes left on the timer and the guy on the stream is having trouble finishing his roof. Yeah, that's a lovely depth to it. I, I love that. That's that's a, a great angle. And and we started like all this stuff like we did things that not other many others have done. And I don't want I didn't come on here to toot my own horn, but it kind of just gives background to like why uh, we're we're at where we're at now. And when we first started and we started doing the big events, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Body Recovery Squad. But they were blowing up at that time. They had hats and t-shirts and there was like 50,000 people in their Discord and people were opening like thousands of tickets to get their bodies recovered. And they had a website on PC Gamer. They had an article, sorry, on PC Gamer about them. And they were huge. And BRS and us decided to partner. And we at one point were a division of the Body Recovery Squad. Ah, that's so cool. I don't know too much about their history, but I do remember that I remember seeing that the people who were actually playing with the most other Valheimers were people who were helping them, like, get their bodies. Like, I remember looking at the Discord and seeing there were loads of people and they'd die and then be like, help, and then... So, so the people who came to help were these people you're describing. So we ended up getting two corporate sponsors from that deal. We ended up partnering with NorthSpirit.com, which was a, an up-and-coming Viking memorabilia website. Uh, yeah. It was online only, and I think they had a physical store in the UK. Uh, and we partnered with uh, GameHo.io, which was a server host website. And we, I never in my life did I think at one point we would have corporate sponsors paying us to do events. And at one point, we were giving out $100 per event to winners. And I know for sure that other other discords and other communities weren't doing that because I had people specifically who joined us for these events from these multi communities like I was talking about before that told me that they weren't doing that so we we held on to that shtick and we definitely pushed it as hard as we could uh, we don't have both corporate sponsors anymore we just have one but I'm still really happy with where we ended up from all that yeah I mean that's uh, that's fascinating it's really cool to learn about this stuff so throughout that process, we made we made some friends, let's just say, and m people like, uh, and I'm going to give them a shout out right now, Emma T. Potato, Kaizen, Jirok, JJ the Builder, uh, so many amazing people that joined us multiple times for events. And because of that, it kind of segues way into what I wanted to talk about next, was that I got invited, I got us and Planeswalkers invited to this almost like round table type deal where literally the other people in the discord are people that have up of like 500k followers on youtube mm -hmm. and our me meager little channel you know we while we don't really care about followers or subscribers we really don't we more care about our people showing up to our events in our in our community and while that still happens you know people will, will just look and briefly scan oh they only have 120 subscribers on twitch or something ah yeah yeah all this off, but we've done two events with jonathan from iron gate we've done a car race with grim we've done at least a dozen events with big profile community members in this game and while we may not have the the accolades on socials yet we're working to get there ah even so honestly there's a chance that valheim will never again be that popular i, I love the game don't get me wrong um but even the fact that you still have one of those sponsors, that sort of thing, after how how Valheim's playership has been, um, that's quite impressive. Like that's a that's a really cool thing. So I, I wouldn't worry too much about that, just because it's just numbers. And at the end of the day, all it takes is getting um, like if you're if you're managing the Planeswalker stuff that way, then if you were to focus so much on the numbers, it would take away the experience that makes the community thing what it is. The point as a community manager can't be to focus on that so much. So what needs to happen is, like you mentioned, getting in relationships with content creators and streamers who have a big enough audience that they can bring you some traffic. So that's not something I am on YouTube. All of my subscribers are dead subscribers. I only have like a thousand people interested in my Valheim content. But it is a food for thought, let's say. 
I've already come to the decision that no matter where we end up on the follower scale, that we have enough accomplishments now I, that I'm happy with what we have done. And never tell my group that we are looking to get followers out of this. It's always just to get the word out. If people in other communities are talking about our build contests next week and are hyped about it, then I'm happy that it provides someone a little bit of comfort in a time, you know, where it doesn't feel that way. So, so let's say someone listening to this wants to join the contest or watch it. How do they go about doing that? The only thing you would need to do to join the build competition is literally just join our Discord. Uh, you can get that link from the official Valheim Discord in the LFG section. You can also get our link at the top of our X page at More Gaming Team, all one word. And once you hit the score, you just click the RSVP button in the events, and literally our admins will will reach out and help you make sure you get logged in and you get the right mod pack. Because of course, uh, it is a vanilla build comp, but there are certain mods we had to use to keep it that way. I'm sure you understand the back end of the game. Uh, we had to use Az Azu anti-cheat and server characters to make sure people stayed honest. From anywhere, they could just click the link on Twitter and join the group tomorrow and we wouldn't vet them in any way and they could join the event tomorrow. Yeah, no, you're, you're doing it the right way, though, definitely. So, so, I see there's this more gaming channel on YouTube, so can they go here to then find the Planeswalker link to Discord? Uh, all of our, if you look at any of our recently uploaded videos, in fact, I just posted a video last night for the build competition that announced a car and Kong deals to judges. Um, and at the, in the description under that link, there is a join us link where you can just click it. Awesome. So if you are watching this, all you have to do, if you want to check out some of these competitions or look at what they're doing, then just go to the description and this in the top of the description of this video, you'll find a link to a Discord channel. And once you join that Discord channel, you get everything you need. And I just want to say that all of what I just discussed leads up to something ultra awesome that I just kind of want to give the community a quick peek into. That round table that I mentioned, there is talk of a Valcon convention happening digitally at the end of this year and possibly in person in Sweden in Stockholm next year. Oh, so that'd be cool. If people want or are interested in that, please support all the content creators that come forward and do the the Valcon digital convention at the end of this year. People like Gwen the Shield Maiden, people like Kaizen, uh, people like Planeswalkers. Please come and support them. And if the event does good, then we can impress Iron Gate and get their approval to do an in-person one next year. Let's see. So, so now that we know a bit more about that, I want to ask you about what was it like for you? You load Valheim up for the first time. You have no understanding of what the game is. And then when you're actually starting to do that communal stuff. Was that like immediate, you hit the ground and you were playing with the community? Or did you have like a, a solo experience and then decide, okay, this is worth involving the community? Could you get more into what that was like for you? So I, I was spoiled. I started the game not with a, a community, but with just a couple of friends that wanted to play the game. So basically we all joined in a small group of three of us and, and played through what at the time was Planes was the end of the game. It yeah. just released at that time. Um, and then after that, I was like, I really want to continue playing this. But it, And this seems like to be the case with a lot of people, but my friends did not. Uh, they had moved on to other games. And I kept playing Valheim, and I wanted people to play with. And the ultimate goal, before the whole event thing became the lifeblood of Planeswalkers was I just wanted people to play Valheim with. I wanted people to play games with that I didn't need to worry, you know, if tomorrow they were going to join voice chat and berate me, you know? That's where Planeswalkers came from. The original idea behind the whole thing came from the idea of community. And that's, honestly, I think that's why we still have so many active and play, uh, veteran players is because we don't treat people like numbers. Uh, when people join, we we bring these people in and we ha give them a seat at the table, and they literally come to our like our world and event development stuff, and they have a say at like what we do. And like, I want these people to be involved. I want them to be invested, like because 
I don't know, when more gaming, you know, kind of, kind of branched out and, and the umbrella of that, you know, branched out from just playing Valheim to other games because we knew the writing was on the wall for Valheim. We knew it would never again get that peak success it did. But we, we weren't really worried about that because in our hearts, we were all gamers. And Valheim is just one of many games that we all love. Yeah, it's, I think you touch on a, an experience that maybe most people listening to this who have, I mean, anyone listening to this at this point is, is really loves Valheim because they're, they're, they're more than three or four minutes into a, a video talking. <laughs> but, but what I'm getting at is that it's a very, very common experience to play and then it's almost as if most of the people who started playing Valheim weren't actually playing for Valheim. They were playing because of the pandemic and the social interaction. The Valheim is just the current game being used. It's just the, the medium for them. And then out of those, maybe, I, I, just to randomly guess a number, maybe one out of three or one out of four players like that actually really likes the game itself, right? So, so that circumstance that you described where you join with a group and then they all lose interest and stop logging into the world, but you still care and want to keep building and making stuff and doing things. But then, of course, it's a bit sad logging into the world that they used to bring value and purpose into, but now nobody's there. You know, it feels like it's dead. <laughs> so that experience, that experience, it's, it's part of the Valheimer's experience, I'd say. <laughs> Yeah, you have to try to find a way to not be attached to the idea of that one world with your friends. You have to more think about it. Where are all the other people that love this game as much as I do? And where do I need to go to meet them? Oh, man. That, 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 that really hits itself, the nail on the head. <laughs> that in of itself comes back around again to the goal of Planeswalkers. And that was to do the events with multi-communities and to get the word out that, you know, you, your friends may have left your server, your world, your character behind, but there are people out there that still love this game. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we're willing to do whatever it takes, even if if people, you know, downvote our stuff on Reddit or, or send people to our Discord to discredit us because they're jealous or I don't know whatever the issue is, but we're going to keep going and keep doing what we're doing and and nothing's going to slow us down, to be honest. And we, you know, we've been through just like every other group. We've been through our ups and downs, and people come and go in our leadership team, and new faces come in, and things change. And sometimes they're for the better. Hi, that's an awesome way to look at it. That's very cool. Quite refreshing. I'm wondering, have you ever noticed, depending on where you show the server, it changes the kind of people you who, who join? I guess it all starts from the people you have around you. If you have moderators and admins that are active and want to be a part of the community, you have active players on your server from Australia, New Zealand, UK, uh, South America, Canada, uh, literally uh, Cyprus, uh, J Japan, uh, all the, the big like countries from all around the world. If you name one, I probably have a player from there. And we, our leadership group and our round table at Planeswalkers is has always been about making sure that we keep our our doors open and we keep it inviting without making sure people don't have to get whitelisted to log in, that they don't need to do an interview, that they don't need to pay yeah. to access our server. Like there are pl people out there, and I won't name names, that still have people pay for their server. And I have players coming to my group telling me, hey, I jumped ship with this last group because now they're charging me yeah. for access to the server. And I'm more, I'm more treated like like a number and, and as profits than as a person. And I'm under the impression that. more than not are that way. But I, I, I honestly don't know. I've never talked to someone who has a paid server. But I've also so not really do, talked to that many others about it in the first place. So <laughs> We typically give players 30 days and we kind of feel them out. Leadership will typically be very involved. Uh, both in voice chat and in game, uh, checking on them, asking if there's anything they need. Um, we're not spying on them. We we want to be involved with our community. Um, so when it the time comes and those 30 days passes, we typically reach out and we offer membership to them. And of course, since we have spon a sponsor now, we they get free Valheim servers through our server sponsor. 
Uh, they get like some free assets, like we have a Planeswalker shield that we had created, and we give that to them, and they get access to our world and, and event development channels so that they feel involved. And I guess because of the way we did done things like that, we haven't really had a lot of instances of griefing, because my people are on top of their of their stuff. I won't curse, but if someone is not acting right, typically we know, and we have logs that we check, and we we make me and my other admin make tons of backups like every day, and and we encourage our, our membership to get their their buildings blueprinted with Infinity Hammer from an admin. So if something does happen, like let's say tomorrow. Iron Gate decides to push it on, uh, out an update that breaks everything, and we have no choice but to go back to a backup and say that backup's broken. We have the blueprint that you could at least use on your local or, or another server. Your stuff is never completely gone. We try to make it cover all of our bases. With Valheim, for example, let's say you want to attract people to a server. If you, you can make the coolest thing in the world in the Ashlands, but you're going to struggle to get people onto that server if all you're showing is the Ashland stuff. But you can just make a super simple YouTube video that just shows some random spot in the Black Forest and you get flooded with people joining to have that beginning Valheim experience, right? And what do you think about that? Why is that? What is that? There's something happening where people are very willing to play the first part of the game. I want to say it's because the, the idea behind the biomes it felt like over time they kind of changed because as as Iron Gate was working on the game as it's in development you know the, the Meadows boss how Iker spawned from an altar he's outside in the individual world the same thing goes for Elder uh, the same thing goes for Bone Mass um, but then Queen is in her own sanctum which honestly was a great idea um, it allowed players to enter a separate instance not uh, separate, not um, connected to all the instances, you know, the trees, the, the materials uh, from the outside world without desync a lot easier by having a separate instance created for the boss. And I felt like when Ashlands came out, I'm not sure. And like, I don't want to say this to like say that Iron Gate, like we love Iron Gate and we support them no matter what with they do. But some of the design decisions when Ashlands came out I don't know. I don't want to say we did disagreed with it or that it, they weren't making the correct choices. It was just more like odd things that they decided with. Like the only having 20 fortresses per server was odd. Like in the Ashlands, the charred fortresses, there's only 20 total for yeah. the whole server. There's only one set of uh, the Dermwin and and on a community server, how do you how do you make it to where everyone gets access to that just like the bosses themselves the biomes uh the physicality of them change i know that the agitation didn't start with ashlands it actually started with mistlands and people really didn't like the idea of the biome having tons of tall pillars that you had to traverse while you couldn't see anything and i understand valheim is a brutal survival game hand quotes but Certain design choices almost feel like you're punishing the player just to punish them. Yeah, the, the boss system in my head, that, that's a whole other thing, though. I, I won't get into that kind of worms. So you're, so you're saying that over time, the, the sort of mentality with the biomes became, let's say, too, too harsh to traverse? Or what do you mean exactly? I mean, if you look at the biomes from planes down, there's at no point where you need to do anything that requires you to constantly micromanage your character. Like, when it comes to both Mistlands and Ashlands, and I understand because it's the end game and they want it to feel difficult. Yeah. But by adding certain mechanics into into Mistlands, they actually made people more turned off from the game because they don't want to go past that biome. People will play meadows to plains and then just stop playing because that's not only was that how they were introduced to the game that used to be the core of what the game used to be but anything after that from what they keep hearing is just a slog and a lot of gamers want to play to relax they don't want to play, uh, play to be stressed 
Yeah, yeah. It, it's also about perception as well, because if they think something is a certain way, because enough people have told them that, it doesn't matter if it's not true. I'm just going to go out and say it. Mistlands is my favorite biome because I think the mist personally adds a new element. Uh, it makes the enemies feel more, I don't know, dangerous. You don't yeah. want to be around that next corner. And that, to me, makes it more immersive. But to someone else, that could make it to where they, it gets turned off, they get turned off from the game and they never come back. There's something to this notion that the mist isn't handled properly. Um, but I, I mean, I feel the, the same way you just mentioned. I personally, like, when I played it the first time, I, I loved it. I didn't really understand why people didn't like it as much. Um, I wasn't playing on a server, so I had that same experience where I played with someone else and then they lose interest. And then, yeah, but it, it, was, it was fun. I liked it. But I, I will say that playing on a no map, no portal server, that thing you just said about it makes it more immersive, right? Now that whole logic is, oof, it, 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 it's fascinating seeing what people do on no map, no portal mode is basically learn nuances of the game that just don't exist with portals. Yet, if you took out portals, the vast majority of players wouldn't want to play. So, it's, it's, it's you know, it's that conundrum. The portals behind the defeated elder boss key, public key. So that new players have to, you know, they have to explore at the beginning, both through meadows and dark forest. You will want to, you know, as you're, you know, going out, you're looking for swamps because that's the natural progression of the game. Um, you can get cores and fine wood and eyes before then and get portals. But we personally thought that ruins the enjoyment of the exploration at the beginning of the game. So I, that's a that's a that's a great way to handle it because that way you protect the initial part of the experience, which is where most players play, obviously, because everybody starts. Um, sounds like a, a great way to handle it. We, we used the uh, Venture Valheim progression mod uh, just to give them a shout out. They, they produce excellent mods. Uh, and through that, we allowed players to basically have their own individual progression while veteran players can still do what they want to do, essentially as satisfying both both groups yeah it's hard to do uh when you have i don't know half your population is grizzled veterans and half the population is people who you know maybe log in once a week yeah or or just brand new players it's uh that that's actually a it's it's good you bring that up because from the game dev perspective that's like the holy grail right there if you can figure out how to give players who play for an hour a week a way to interact positively with players who play for eight hours a day that's the the source of most conflict that i've observed in like mmos and guilds and games is the reality that we're all supposed to enter this world equally which is bullshit because the reality is some of us have more time than others and those of us who have the most time have the most advantage it's not a fair circumstance right but I, I also had just as much trouble with lag and, and it's kind of sad because Valheim is such a cooperative incredible building adventure so it's it's kind of a glaring issue isn't it <laughs> when people come to build together the game becomes unplayable so we have a, a full QA team that literally like logs in and like you know complains and that's the point of their job uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that always came up was, like you were saying, the, the high instance count and lag issues in community areas. And so what we decided was, instead of having everybody bunch up into maybe two or three really big towns, we split them up into a dozen smaller public player community areas. And each one was themed. Like there was one that uh, we had a builder theme it like in the swamp, and there was one who themed it on an island. and you basically would pick a theme of community area that you wanted to live in, and that was maybe only like three or four, maybe five houses. Um, because Yeah, that sounds effective. Community areas of smaller size, then people tend to uh, stay in, in, in smaller groups, and I know that sucks to, to hear that you're, you're splitting your community into smaller groups, but like we've just both discussed, the nature of the game and the back end of the game, you just can't do any more than that. Yeah, certainly. 
certainly quite challenging. What our answer was to the, the community areas, because our first server, we did that. We had one massive town where even Grimm from Iron Gate came in and he was looking at all the shops we had because we had little shops set up where people can buy and sell stuff. Grimm would end up going, ended up going into the, the shop called Boats and Hoes. And the guy who sold that sold a boat and with every boat you get a free hoe. And Grimm <laughs> did not stop laughing about that and he loved it. And, and, and of course those type of, uh, those types of, types of experiences happen in big community areas. But what people don't understand is like, press F2, you're getting maybe 10 frames, five frames in, in, in massive, like 10,000, 9,000 instance areas. Just didn't work. Yeah, but now, now we know that. And this is the thing where uh, Valheim, it's almost like Valheim is the, the engine, but the, the community hasn't really, and don't get me wrong, because the, like, the RPG server, there absolutely are people who are taking Valheim and really using it to its potential. Um, but my, my general sense is that the community as a whole doesn't really realize, right, like how much can be done with servers. And, and I think one of the reasons for that is like, okay, we had to find out about this stuff, right? Like how this lag works, how to manage a town, how to deal with players, the realities of the game, its limitations, etc. But really, this should all be sort of, I don't know, like taught or part of the, the game or something. And, what would Valheim be like if the game actually tried to get you to build? <laughs> like, because it made me realize, you know, fuck, the building is like this incredible part of Valheim, but you don't even need to do it. And there's not even, I mean, yeah, you need a bed, you need to spawn, you need a place to put your stuff. But like, imagine the difference between like, okay, you go, you get some items, you spawn the boss. What if to fight the boss in the first place, you had to build a castle to defend it from. And that's how you summoned the boss. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like there's there's multiple parts of Valheim that people enjoy, like building and fighting and inventory and making their estate, etc. Yeah. A lot of people feel like building, while popular, is, is not at the forefront of, of the gameplay. When Especially with new players, they're always worried if I go into swamp, am I gonna get ganked? Or they're yeah, not yeah. About like, how do I make this wall have more depth so that my build looks more? It pops more when you look at it. And I think that kind of comes back to the events, like our build competition. You got to find new and exciting ways to en entice builders to want to compete, uh, and and not only just to compete just for the clout, but just for for that camaraderie between all the builders so that they have something they can enjoy and you know not just a pvp event or or a hunger games event you know all the big combat based events that are popular yeah and in, in my head that's the thing that has more potential I, I don't know about the people who've joined your servers but on on my server the players who stay for the long run and come back are always builders there's people who join and do combat and play maybe religiously for a week or two or a month and then leave. But the people who come back, who play over and over and over again, who can be in the Black Forest for a thousand hours, never go into the swamp and not really care, they're always builders. So the thing that I try and focus on now is figuring out, instead of like trying to bring more builders, it's like how to make the rest of the game more accessible to those builders. Makes sense. And I guess they kind of added that with the, the modifiers, allowing builders to have a world with literally no danger at all. Yeah, yeah, the passive mode. Stuff like that. They've, they've done a good job with those. I, I'm, I'm really happy with the world modifiers and this notion that like they want us to be able to customize Valheim to the way we want to play. And that, as a developer, it's a rare mentality, to be honest. Um, usually developers are like, very much like, this is the way you're supposed to play, and if you don't play it this way, grr. I have to agree with that. Lots of gatekeepers say that, you know, if it's not vanilla, then it's not Valheim. But in my opinion, there is no wrong way to play Valheim because the game yeah. is a sandbox game and you have freedom of choice and to go wherever you want. I don't honestly think there is a wrong way to play it besides maybe griefing 
But other than that, if you're playing to have fun and you just want to join other players in a community-centered uh, experience, then yeah. I, I, def I definitely agree that a lot of people spend more time over what everyone else is playing and, and not paying attention to are they enjoying the core experience of Valheim. And honestly, Valheim is a blank canvas. It, it is completely open no matter what you want to do. It could probably be, be fulfilled either through your own actions or through jo joining a modders group and reaching out for a commission. Yeah, I mean, even, and with Expand World Prefabs, you don't even need a, like, okay, making a mod for Valheim, you need to know a little bit about programming. Whereas with Expand World Prefabs, you literally don't. You can just, it's like, uh, you basically just put a short little script on the server and then it alters things. So like the script has to work right and it has to be high quality, you know, so that the person who made it like play tested it and thought of like, okay, what if the player tries to grief it or does this or whatever. But aside from that, it's, it's really next level stuff. So one of the things I'm trying to do now is get people more aware of uh, Expand World Prefabs and the, the options that it gives them. I'll probably start ending this now. Is there anything you want to cover before that? Um, we can talk again about like planeswalkers and people, how people can reach your reach your page and everything. Or if there's anything else you want to bring up, just let me know. Yep. So just to, to reiterate, uh, the planeswalkers are a Valheim clan uh, under the More Gaming Hub umbrella, which is our Discord community. We play Helldivers, we play Valheim, we play Fallout 76, like you name it. It probably has a group of people playing it. So if you are looking to join us, you're going to want to look for more gaming. So that's going to be on X, more gaming team on Twitch. Also, I believe it's also more gaming team on one word. And on YouTube, you could just Google more gaming and Planeswalkers or Planeswalkers Valheim, anything like that. And you'll most likely find some of our videos. And we also have a, a raid that we're releasing uh, before the summer is up with a custom boss that will... Before he's defeated, the entire world will remain night, and there's a new raid. Uh, uh, until you uh, beat the Dark Tower, which is a multi-floor raid, and defeat the boss, the, the world will remain night, and it will suck for every. You know, it, it's the thing where you're like, hey, the world's going to be night. We need to do something about it. So all the players are going to get together and try to beat this boss, and it's going to be a cool community event. Yeah, that sounds awesome. All right then, thanks for watching everybody. And remember, if you're interested in being interviewed or you have anybody who you think should be interviewed, then just reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to anybody who's willing. Uh, you don't have to show your face, you can. We could do it in Valheim. We could do it just like an audio call like this one. Whatever you're more comfortable with, just comment or you can send an email to me at Jack Pittman Nika. that's J-A-C-K-P-I-T-M-A-N at gmail.com. Sometimes that goes into spam, so the most effective way is to just comment below so that I can reach out to you directly. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you in the next video. Bye! Hi, everybody.